Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session, of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a recent book, Making the Forever War, Marilyn B. Young on the Culture and Politics of American Militarism, edited by Mary L. Dudziak and Mark Philip Bradley. Joining us this afternoon are two commentators, my colleague Melanie McAllister of the George Washington University and Monica Kim of the University of Madison, Wisconsin, both veterans themselves of this seminar. I'm Eric Arneson from George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, sharing responsibilities with the other co-chair, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center, who will be introducing our panelists and moderating today's discussion. But since today is a federal holiday and the Wilson Center is officially closed, Christian is participating in a, well, non-official civilian capacity. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and today, the American Historical Association's National History Center primarily. Over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center since pandemic restrictions here in the virtual realm. Behind the scenes, we thank two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Weachley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank one of our institutional supporters, the GW Department of History, as well as our anonymous individual donors. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the question and answer section, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom. That way you get to pose the question directly yourself, or you can use the Q&A function in which Christian will read your question. Those watching on Facebook Live can email questions to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. And with that, I turn the screen over to Christian Osterman, who will introduce our speakers and later commentators. Uh, but first, I believe, uh, has uh, uh, an announcement uh, about uh, a friend of the Wilson Center and the seminar. Christian, the Zoom room is yours. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, let me also add a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us for this discussion of Making the Forever War, which honors and makes accessible some of the writings on war by Marilyn Young, a giant in the field of international history. I'm so glad we can, do, we can do this here today. Marilyn was one of our very first speakers when we launched the Washington History Seminar in 2010. Before I introduce our speakers today, let me say a few words on an, about another giant in our field who we lost just this past week. Marty Sherwin, a preeminent historian of the nuclear age, author of The Pathbreaking, A World Destroyed, Hiroshima and Its Legacies, of Gambling with Armageddon, Nuclear Roulette from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis, published to great acclaim just last year, and of course, co-author of the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Robert Oppenheimer. He was an extraordinary scholar, deeply principled humanitarian and nuclear, weapon, nu nuclear weapons critic, a passionate and dedicated mentor and a dear friend to many of us. He helped spawn a new generation of nuclear historians as a senior advisor to the Wilson Center's Nuclear Proliferation uh, International History Project. For the last uh, decade or so, Leopoldo Nuti and I have had the privilege of working with Marty and running an annual nuclear history boot camp in the mountains north of Rome. We will miss his wisdom, his advice, his engagement, his warmth, his wit and humor. We will celebrate Marty's life and his many contributions at a later stage, but I did not want to um, uh, want this passing to go unacknowledged in this forum. But now to Marilyn Young, I'm making the forever war, and our co-editors. Let me introduce uh, our editors first. Mark Philip Bradley is the Bernadot E. Schmidt uh, Distinguished Service Professor uh, of History at the University of Chicago and editor of the American Historical Review. He's the author of The World Reimagined Americans and Human Rights in the 20th Century, published in 2016 and relaunched as Eric mentioned uh, this volume at the Washington History Seminar that fall, Vietnam at War published in 2009, and Imagining Vietnam in America, the Making of Post-Colonial Vietnam, 
And with Marilyn Young, he was co-editor of Making Sense of the Vietnam Wars, published in 2008. A frequent collaborator in the Cold War International History Project and many other activities over the year. It's great to welcome you back, Mark. Great to have you. Marielle Dudziak, the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University, is a leading legal historian and scholar of the United States and the world. She works at the intersection of US domestic and international affairs. She is a past president of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, and she's the author of Wartime, an idea, its history, its consequences, published in 2012. Exporting American Dreams, Thurgood Marshall's African Journey, published in 2008, and Cold War Civil Rights, Race and the Image of American Democracy, published in the second edition in 2011, as well as other works. We have benefited from her insights as a commentator in, at the Washington History Semi Seminar many times, and we're glad to have you back, Mar Mary. Welcome to both of you. The Zoom room is yours. Thank, thank you all for Zooming in today. I'd like to start on this um, Indigenous Peoples Day to acknowledge that I'm Zooming in from the ancestral lands of the Muscogee Creek people uh, who helped, who settled in and, and worked the land uh, that is now occupied by Emory University. Um, and, we, you know, we so appreciate you joining us today to, uh, to talk about uh, this book, which brings together not all of Marilyn Young's uh, work, but but some of it, and and I'll start today by saying a little, just a little bit about Marilyn, but but mostly to talk about you know what is this book, why is it in the form that it is, and what were we trying to accomplish um, with this volume, um, which is just a slice of Marilyn's contributions, um, but. First, my, my co-editor Mark Bradley and I are grateful to the National History Center, the Wilson Center, uh, to Eric Arneson and Chris Osterman and, and Rachel Wheatley uh, for hosting us today. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Cyrus Jinn, a University of Chicago graduate student uh, who works with Mark, uh, who helped us with making the forever war. Um, and also, of course, our editors at the University of Massachusetts Press, Ed Martini and Scott Laterman, who quickly became enthusiastic about our vision for the book and, and helped us bring it into being. Um, so Marilyn Young uh, was a landmark scholar of American militarism, the US war in Vietnam, um, and the Forever Wars. She's most well known for her book, The Vietnam Wars, which was published in 1990. Uh, Young was deeply admired by generations and, of students and scholars in the history of US foreign relations, of history of foreign relations generally. Um, her work and her force of personality um, has really enabled the work of others. I, my last book, I think would not, seriously not have come into being if it hadn't been that I happened to run into Marilyn at the Library of Congress one day when I was in the dumps of, about it and she set me on track. Um, her work is of tremendous importance on the role of war in US history, um, of war as a feature of US history. Now, this the, the, the book, Making the Forever Wars, we think is a necessary book and um, it, but it's it's not nece it's necessary not because it's a remembrance by her friends. Um, it's not a feshrift book. It's not a career summary book. Um, instead, uh, it captures what was essentially Marilyn's focus in the last decades of her life. Instead of another monograph, um, she published a torrent of essays. She went everywhere and talked about everything. Um, and I knew that uh, some of those essays would be lost and people wouldn't find them. Um, and I knew that because she would send me things. I'm sure this happened to everyone uh, that she knew. We'd have a conversation and she said, do you really need to do this, do that? And, and she would emphasize it by sending me an essay where she had written about something and and it, and probably the best example is the big sleep um, which is an essay about how war becomes forgotten um, and it came up between the two of us in a conversation about 
um, of all people, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice, um, who fought in World War II, World, I'm sorry, fought in the Civil War, um, was injured three times, um, wrote in, in, at the time about the terribleness of war, but then in his older years um, to the graduating class of Harvard University, wrote, wrote about how it was adorable that young men would give their lives to a cause they did not even understand. And so she insisted that to understand forgetting across time um, and how kind of fantasies about what war is are built in across time with the reality of carnage and the, um, the, the sort of death and, and, and true destruction and pain and suffering of war being marginalized in the narratives. It, I, I needed to think about that um, by thinking about people like Holmes, who enabled that um, false narrative um, to, uh, to be continued over time. So, so that essay she wrote for a conference that was held in Italy. And the piece appeared in an Italian conference volume. Um, and it's really hard to find. I know because I had to track it down for something I was doing um, and to, to cite it correctly. Um, so we, we gathered together essays like that. Um, and our goal was essentially to make Maryland's work accessible to the next generation. Um, and to do that, we produced a volume that was essentially short enough uh, that it could be assigned in courses. So that's what determines the, the page length of the book, um, is that we wanted it to be accessible as a course book. We thought that that was one way to get Marilyn's voice um, out to the next generation. Um, there's also a, a bibliography that, um, that can lead you to, to many other sources. Um, so um, a key focus of Marilyn's work on the, um, for, was on the forever war, which of course, is an ambiguous term that fits the ambiguities of American war. Um, she wrote in 2011 in her presidential address to the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, I find that I have spent most of my life as a teacher and a scholar thinking and writing about war. The pattern of American wars, she thought, uh, came to seem like a continuation, the very substance of history. Along the way, war became less visible. Um, historians have to work against this, she insisted. Our continuous task must be to make war visible, vivid, and inescapable part of the country's self-consciousness, as inescapable a subject of study as it is a reality. And basically, the purpose of this book is to further Marilyn's vision, to make war vivid and visible. Um, so I hope you will enjoy the book. I hope you will share it with your students and I very much look forward to um, our conversation today. Thank you, Mary. You know, one of the great things about working on this book with you, and there were, there were many things that were really marvelous to do together on this, was uncovering some of what we came to call Maryland's ephemera. So yes, there's the big sleep, which is hardly ephemera, but there were other kind of smaller things that we were able to include in the book. And I think in some ways, my favorite part of it is her top 10 list, which in a nutshell, captures her view of American wars and the centrality, I think, of American wars in Asia for getting her to where she finally went in terms of American war and American militarism. It also captures just how honest and also really funny Marilyn could be. So here we go, just as a kind of teaser for the book, top 10 lessons Marilyn Young believed policymakers had learned from the Vietnam War. Number one, control the press. Two, dominate. Here, think of a former president who shall not be named, dominate the historical narrative. Three, 
always support the troops, if not the war. Four, avoid a draft. Five, make sure that body counts stay to one side. Six, if atrocities surface, double down on bad apples. Seven, watch your language. It's never an escalation, it's just a surge. Eight, if you get into trouble, you can always up the ante. Here, think Cambodia. Nine, find some heroes, ideally some who are not POW MIAs. And 10, there is always a tactical path to victory, even when imaginary rather than real. These are for Marilyn, the building blocks of the forever war. And they are, as she says, the lessons that most policymakers appear to have learned from the American war in Vietnam. But for Marilyn, it was a very different set of lessons that policymakers needed to learn. She writes, quote, a bad war can't be fixed except by ending it. Failing to have dealt with the old bad wars means repeating them. I'm delighted like Mary to come together today to talk about the work of Marilyn Young, who I think is arguably the preeminent historian of war's place in American society. And that we can do this at a crucial moment for thinking about the concept of forever war. Like Mary, I wanna thank the National History Center for putting all this together. And I particularly wanna thank Monica and Melanie for coming in and joining in the conversation with us today. Um, Leia Glassman, Marilyn's sister, is with us somewhere. We can't see anybody, but um, Leila, it's, it's great that you could join us as well. And I hope maybe some of the rest of the family is here too. I'd like to go in two directions with my brief remarks this afternoon. One, I wanna lift up the centrality of the history of American war in Asia for the critiques that Marilyn pioneered of the forever war. And then I wanna consider the ways in what I'll call Marilyn's style might offer scholarly models of engagement to us in what is a fraught moment. So the marvelous essays that are collected in Making the Forever War addressed a set of still pressing and urgent questions. One, why does war never end? What are the origins of ongoing military conflict? How have US leaders justified their decisions in war? Why does the American public support these wars and how could opposition to them be so fractured? And what are the consequences for countries and for peoples on the receiving end of US military force? Maryland's answers to these questions point to the central place of Asian history for the larger development of her approach to forever war. Now, Marilyn, to be clear, did not present herself as an Asianist. She came to Asian history through the lens of American engagement in the region and what she came to learn about East and Southeast Asian history along the way. As she wrote later about Vietnam, quote, it changed the shape of my moral world. Marilyn's scholarship spanned a century of American intervention in Asia. Her first book, Rhetoric of Empire, took the American decision to embark on an overseas empire at the turn of the 20th century and the US intervention in the Boxer Rebellion as its focus. And then she moved to the Chinese Civil War in the late 1940s and the rise of Mao and the PRC. And finally, she landed in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, notably with her magisterial one volume history, Mary mentioned earlier, the Vietnam Wars, 1945 to 1990. As she moves through these various complex territories, Marilyn was also a founding member of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, a group that would collectively launch a searing critique of US policies and warfare in Asia. The more Asia-focused essays that make up the first half of Making the Forever War help us see how the region was central in shaping Marilyn's broader thinking. For instance, in her essay, The Hard Sell, she examines public doubts about the war in Korea and its acquiescence to the Truman administration's prosecution of war on the peninsula, arguing that the Korean case demonstrated to future administrations that American wars could in fact be waged without public enthusiasm or, she would add, understanding. 
The same struggle for liberty explores official American framings of war in Korea and Vietnam to surface what Marilyn called a persisting American dilemma, quote, how to acquire an empire without naming it, or better, in the name of the right of self-determination for all peoples. It was this kind of granular historical work that shaped her emergent conception of forever wars and remains generative for how we think about war in the 20th and early 21st centuries. I wanna close by thinking a little bit about style. Marilyn was a New Yorker, and she was a New Yorker in the best sense of that word. When people told Marilyn Young to sit down, Marilyn tended to just keep standing and keep talking. There's a story that some people on the call may have actually observed, I just heard it kind of through Marilyn, about her ferocity in speaking truth to power, and that was an encounter she had with Henry Kissinger, where she told me later she gave him a piece of her mind, and I imagine that she did. Um, Marilyn was a diplomatic historian of the New Left, and she was not keen on history that didn't push on what she saw as the structural failures of American diplomacy. She was an activist and she was a scholar, and she did not see a necessary separation between the two. For her, one mutually informed the other. She was a second wave feminist who led the first consciousness raising sessions at the University of Michigan when she was a faculty member there in the early 1970s. And she would continue to champion the place of women in the academy in ways large and small throughout her career. And as one of the few women in the field of diplomatic history, something that she was delighted to see change over the course of her lifetime, she didn't, in her words, quote, suffer pigs gladly. All that was Marilyn, but there was another side to her intellectual and personal engagements as well. She was, as Mary said, a really warm friend and colleague who tirelessly mentored dozens and dozens of us as we were coming up. And though she had a politics, she liked people, at least most people, including those from across the aisle politically. And she often reached out to them engaging them in conversation, and in some cases, mentoring them as well. It's probably just as well that Marilyn didn't live to see the insurrection. Had she, no doubt she would have called it out for what it was. And to be honest, I don't really imagine her reaching across the aisle to make chit chat with the MAGA folks. On the fall of Kabul, I can only imagine she would have pushed on Biden and Blinken at the same time pushed back hard on the retrospective musings of the Bush national security team. But when the battle was done, her ideal would have been to invite at least some of them out for a scotch and maybe for an Italian dinner at a little place in the village and they may be uptown for a nice opera at the Met. As I say, Marilyn liked people and she liked an engaged life. It made her work and those of us around her richer and more fully formed. These are difficult days when we don't always know how to talk to one another about some of the most pressing issues that face our country. And I think it's both the substance of Marilyn's work and the style by which she made her way in the world that can offer us a path forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark and Mary. Before I introduce our two uh, distinguished commentators, let me remind everyone of the three ways that our members in the audience have uh, to participate. Our preference is for you to use the raise hand function and you will be queued. Uh, and uh, once we get to the Q&A, we'll call on you. Uh, first, and um, uh, you'll be asked to unmute, um, and then you will be able to pose your question. Um, you can also use the Q&A um, function uh, on my Zoom screen, it's at the top of the, the screen, and uh, write and post your question, and we'll um, uh, post the questions then to our panelists. And finally, if you're following us on Facebook Live, feel free to email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org with your questions and comments. 
With that, let me turn to our commentators. Um, Melanie McAllister is professor of American Studies and International Affairs at the George Washington University. She's the author or co-editor of five books, including The Kingdom of God Has No Borders, A Global History of American Evangelicals, published by Oxford in 2018, Epic Encounters, Culture, Media, and U.S. Interests in the Middle East, published in 2001. And uh, she is the um, author of the uh, volume four of the forthcoming Cambridge History of America and the World, co-edited with David Engerman and Max Friedman. She currently serves on the board of the directors of the American Council of Learned Societies, as well as the boards of Diplomatic History, Modern American History, and American Quarterly. It's wonderful to have you with us, Melanie. Monica Kim is professor of uh, is professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She focuses on three issues that have centrally informed the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the decolonizing world during the 20th century and beyond, the relationship between liberalism and racial formations, global militarism and sovereignty, and transnational political movements. Her first book, the award-winning The Interrogation Rooms of the Korean War, the Untold History was published in 2019 and tells the story of the changing script of warfare in the mid 20th century through the war that was not an official war, the police action called the Korean War. We were delighted to have her talk about her work at the Washington History um, Seminar uh, that year. She has also co-edited a journal uh, issue focused on policing, justice and uh, radical imagination with the Radical History Review. Dr. Kim is currently working on a project entitled The World That Hunger Made to Korea, the United States, and Afro-Asia. Welcome back, Monica. Uh, who'd like to start? Melanie? Sure, thank you. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be able to be part of this group and to talk about this collection, which I think is very exciting. And I, and I say this, also as someone who of course knew Marilyn's work but did not know her personally, I think I only ever met her once. And after reading this volume, I realized how much of her work I didn't really realize the extent of it or the range of the work that she did. So I wanted to highlight just briefly three things that really jumped out to me in the book and were very um, compelling. And the first thing was the importance given to Korea. Now I imagine Monica will have some things to say about this given it's her expertise, but for me, the fact that I you know, thought of Marilyn as a historian of Vietnam and the fact that Korea is central to so much of what goes on in this, in this collection was very striking. And I mention it in a couple of cases. One, there is a chapter, a quite extraordinary chapter called Bombing Civilians, which is uh, devastating in and of itself. Um, it highlights another one of her themes throughout, which is the particular significance of air power, both in the arsenal of US military force and also as a doctrine that helps in the process of abstracting war's suffering, another major theme of the book. But in that chapter on bombing civilians, she puts Korea as a cornerstone of this larger edifice that she's trying to describe about the ways that bombing works, about the number of civilians that have been bombed, and then how much of that bombing happened in Asia, kind of referring back to Mark's comments about the ways in which Asia becomes central to this story about warfare that, that uh, Young is telling. You really see her comments here as a kind of early brief in what would Paul Chamberlain would later describe as as Asia as the Cold War's killing fields. And she really highlights that, that in that chapter on, on bombing civilians. But there's another way in which she talks about Korea that was equally interesting to me, which is the unpublished chapter, that remarkable unpublished chapter on the opposition to war in Korea, Korea and Vietnam that had been given as a talk when never published before. Um, so thank you for this because the question there she, she posits is that people were as opposed to the war in Korea as they were to the war in Vietnam in terms of opinion, how many people were in favor versus how many people weren't. So she's trying to interest, she's interested in the question of why there was not a viable anti-war movement, even though there was opposition. In fact, she describes her task there as trying to understand, quote, the difference between the expression and the existence of opposition. 
So the, the existence of opposition to the war is one thing. How does it give, how do, what are the conditions under which that can be expressed in a meaningful public way? And she pays attention both to the context of Korea, the silencing of the left, of course, in the uh, McCarthy period, the defeat of the Progressive Party in 1948, a whole range of domestic issues that might have shaped how people were responding, felt not free to respond to the Korean War. But then that allows her to highlight some of the specificities of the Vietnam period, which may be more familiar um, in the sense of um, thinking about the, the cultural changes that were afoot, but also here highlighting the significance of the civil rights movement to changing what people, how people, how comfortable people felt speaking up and out in an organized way against um, American foreign policy. So I found this stuff on Korea really interesting throughout and in those two chapters in particular. The second theme that was very striking to me is the one of memory, which the editors talk about in their introduction to the book. It is throughout the volume and in ways that um, I hadn't quite appreciated in Young's work. Um, uh, I'll mention the chapter of The Big Sleep, which Mary talked about, which was written in 1998, in which Marilyn unpacked the question of how wars are remembered and forgotten. And the, for her, the, the project was that she had originally, she says, originally thought that Vietnam was unique in how hard people worked to bury the story of the war. And what she came to realize, I'm quoting here, is the aftermath of every war in which the United States has engaged was marked by similar efforts to erase the experience of the war itself. And she has uh, it's a remarkable chapter for Young's real engagement with literary text and with literary criticism in um, you know, quite interdisciplinary way, showing how the literature of war, even literature that claims to be or aims to be critical, had tended to reinvent the tropes of the heroism of war, war as a crucible of personhood, a kind of romance of the self, the noble suffering of the soldier, um, I was impressed by her serious engagement with literary scholars, um, including her brief invocation and conversation with Amy Kaplan uh, moving to me because it reminded me of the many commitments that they shared as scholars um, across disciplinary lines. But the piece, the chapter was also very sad for me in a different way. It's written in 1998, as I mentioned. And Young's argument was that um, despite this attempt and the quite successful attempt often to re-narrate war in a heroic mode, she felt that after Vietnam, it really hadn't worked. That Vietnam, she says, I'm gonna quote again, was the first American conflict since the turn of the century in which the reality of the war that the soldiers fought was acknowledged at home. And because of that, she thought, it meant that George H.W. Bush had had trouble mobilizing Americans behind the 90, 91 Iraq war, more trouble than they expected, um, even though it was fought to kind of get rid of the Vietnam syndrome. Um, and she ends her piece with this kind of poignant um, moment, and it's poignant not for its prescience, but rather for the opposite. So in 1998, she's looking back um, at the reluctance or what she saw as the relative reluctance of Americans to commit to the 1990-91 Iraq war and writes that she would quote, I would like to think that many Americans have not been willing or able this time to go back to sleep. That is to forget wars and what they mean and how they're fought and their costs. And of course that's written um, just about three years before 9-11. So finally, I'll just mention then, in fact, the impact of the Iraq Afghanistan war on terror on her writing and thinking, um, which you see many examples of in the book. I'll just mention the last um, chapter of her Schaefer presidential address, um, uh, 12 years after the article I just mentioned, 10 years into the post 9-11 wars. And Young has now clearly revised her optimism, um, her notion that the history of the end of the Vietnam War might be a history of people's greater awareness. But instead, um, she has come to argue that war is not just a significant part of US history, but war is the substance of American history. And she highlights even more, you know, I, I feel that there's a kind of darker turn as she gets to this material that 
Um, the periods that are claimed as eras of peace are likely enough many times to be actually eras of simply invisible wars, invisible to Americans, not to the people who are living them. And, and so now for her, with the launch of the war on terror, the US had launched its next long war. And unlike the Cold War, she says, this one cannot, by definition, come to an end because it's a war against a tactic, not against an ideology or a geopolitical entity. But the war on terror makes all but explicit something that Young now wants us to understand has long been a reality, um, that war is the substance of American foreign policy. And the job of the historian of US foreign policy, she insists in this piece, is to refuse the narrative, the narrative strategies or the narrative um, uh, kind of practices that make wars seem more heroic in practice, less deadly for their victims, less visible to their sponsors and more amenable to the US public. We live in a time of war, she tells us, we have almost always been living in a time of war. And our job as historians is not to mistake that for a time of peace. Um, and I would say she just to end by saying she does that by asking us to do it from two perspectives. One is as scholars, we need to understand and pay attention to US military practice and doctrine. We need to understand what war, air power is, how the military thinks about it and why it matters. Um, we need to understand what strategies are mobilized, what weapons and tactics are deployed to actually get into the, the grime of the, the war fighting tactics of the US military. But we also need to understand the power of narrative, the structuring work that culture does, and its trade and forgetfulness, denial, and romanticism. Um, I think that Marilyn would uh, have a lot to say right now as we watch the story of the long US misadventure in Afghanistan being simultaneously revised and erased. That's it. Thank you, Mary and Mark, um, for inviting me um, to participate in this. This is incredibly meaningful for me as somebody who, um, for whom Marilyn was a longtime mentor, um, and she was also a colleague and friend of mine um, during my time at NYU. Um, and also when I was a graduate student, um, I did present at the Cold War seminar. So, um, so yeah, her, her impact um, in terms of mentorship um, is certainly very broad and, and wide. Um, so I'll, I'll just read from some prepared remarks I have um, on the collection. Um, right now, I guess I should say that I'm teaching a course on American foreign relations here at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I have assigned this book. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about my students actually um, in, in preparing these remarks. So reading this book really brought home for me how important and singular Marilyn's voice was because she was so effective in revealing the dynamics that create the echo chamber of how Americans talk about war. She was able to get at the heart of how America is deeply self-referential -refer in a kind of closed feedback loop where US exceptionalism requires Americans to refer solely to their own wars in order to frame future and current wars. Hence her remark that Americans, according to mainstream discourse, seem to be able to wage only two kinds of wars, Vietnam or World War II. She also lays out how Americans are seduced by their own rhetoric, their own purported universalism, whether as journalists, academics, or policymakers. And Marilyn also breaks down for us in these essays how Americans have wholesale accepted the limited and limiting tropes and parameters for how to talk about American warfare. So for me, this collection of Marilyn's work provokes an important question that I believe Marilyn proposes in different ways throughout her essays. How can we talk about war in a different way? How do we interrupt the solipsistic discourse of American empire? In other words, how do we reveal how deep war is for American consciousness so we can wake up from our big sleep? These writings highlight how effective Marilyn's voice was in modeling how to write critical historical analysis from what I would call the belly of the beast, essentially, to be a member of the American body politic implicated in the ongoing violent project of US empire. And really throughout the collection, um, what's, what was very powerful for me was to really have a sense of that there is really an ethical imperative and political urgency in her writing. 
So in the pages of this collection, there is her conviction in using the writing of history as a countervailing force to how, in US society, war was supposedly something that generals and soldiers did over there. She wanted to show how warfare entirely structured our realities over here, while we should also be holding those in power alongside our own selves accountable for what was also happening over there. In many ways, the lovers of power and war often appear to be so far removed from the American public. And Marilyn, rather than accepting that as inevitable, brings back the workings of US warfare and decision making to the ground. So um, I, in reflecting upon the collection, I pulled a few themes, um, kind of what I consider to be the main preoccupations or tropes and how Americans talk about war, according to Marilyn. Um, so I'll start with the specifics. One is um, Americans have a preoccupation with body counts. So in that chapter um, five, counting bodies in Vietnam, Marilyn talks about how in a war without a front line, the success and progress of war was linked to counting bodies, but then also how the counting of bodies meant that certain bodies and deaths did not count. Number two, um, technology or what Marilyn quote said, America's 20th century faith in the language of violence. So here we can turn to chapter seven on bombing civilians where Marilyn moves from Nagasaki and Hiroshima to the shock and awe doctrine of Bush to drone warfare, where Marilyn shows that the fiction that these technologies enable the US to conduct so-called limited war is entirely untenable because on the ground and in the air, these are in the end wars of annihilation. Number three, preoccupation with American innocence, which also Marilyn shows oddly comes from the supposed technological superiority where statistics and spectacular bombing gives a kind of remove from the act of mass killing. But Marilyn's constant critique throughout this collection is clear. She's critiquing how America always claims that it is never the aggressor. Number four, America's preoccupation of presenting itself always as being misunderstood, <laughs> the misunderstood empire. Somehow the people Americans are killing are somehow always misunderstanding the United States. The Koreans misunderstand, the Vietnamese misunderstand. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And I think Marilyn really um, shows this kind of um, drama of rhetoric um, really well in this collection. And the last one, the kind of theme that I had pulled out, um, the preoccupation that every war the US is involved in is supposedly a new war, right? So for example, in the Korean War, uh, Marilyn writes, it's as if the Philippine-American War and the US occupation of Haiti had, had never occurred, right? This kind of bewilderment <laughs> in a sense of US on the ground and the Korean Peninsula and a bewilderment in front of actually something they had wrought, right? Marilyn was also concerned that the American public would simply view itself as, um, as American empire viewed itself as quote, exceptional, powerful, and passive. In this collection, Marilyn does not limit her critique to the actions and decisions made by policymakers and military generals. Marilyn was also invested in giving us a different history, a different portrait of the American public in front of war an American public that was not passive. And she shows that in fact, um, and exactly what you were saying, Melanie, I was really struck um, by what she was saying about the Korean War, right? That there was actually dissent <laughs> um, against the war. So she, she shows in that chapter, um, at least for me, how that kind of passivity of, of this kind of portrait of the American public as passive is actually in a retroactive narrative uh, manufactured over time. Um, you know, before I go a little bit more in, into that chapter about um, the Korean War, I also wanted to share a quick quote from that chapter, which kind of goes back to what Mark was saying about style. And I feel like I just, I can't <laughs> just glance over this because this is also, I think, very important um, in terms of uh, Marilyn's voice, but also what I think my students are, are, are really gonna be responding well to. So here's a, a quick quote from this chapter on, on the Korean War. The Korean War was not only hard to sell during the three years in which it was fought, 
it has been a hard sell ever since. It is remembered as having been forgotten, a product that failed to move, a war that wasn't new and improved, a Ford Pinto of a war. So here, <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, it's just such a good encapsulation about American mainstream discourse around the Korean War. And here we have Marilyn's wonderful wit, right? And it's just so effective here because it makes this seemingly sacred and high level discourse around war actually more mundane and just even kind of absurd. And I, I think this is where humor or kind of just laughing at power really, right, is, is so powerful. And, and I wanted to highlight that about Marilyn's writing because um, for those of us um, who, who knew her, um, that was also the force of, of herself as, as a scholar, as an activist um, and, as a, and as a citizen. Okay, so back to the Korean War and American public uh, dissent. So in these chapters, um, Marilyn lays out the step-by-step -step crushing of dissent against the Korean War via anti-communist mechanisms. As she wrote, quote, any, dis um, any organized dissent was tainted by immediate association with communism. Mobilization, therefore, seems to have been out of the question. I deeply appreciate this chapter because it's an essay that both shows that McCarthyism was not an immediate juggernaut, flattening all political dissent immediately, and also how anti-communism operated at different scales in American political life. I find in my classroom that students often think of McCarthyism and the early Cold War as kind of one solid monolithic, <laughs> monolithic political era until the Vietnam era or Vietnam War. Marilyn's chapters that bring the Korean War and the Vietnam War into the same frame is so useful to help students see the continuities and parallels, in fact, and to not only conceive of the Vietnam War as a moment of rupture. Especially in terms of American historical memory around warfare, Marilyn demonstrates how Korea and Vietnam are actually simply two sides of the same imperial coin. And I will say that um, so far in terms of um, the teaching of this course that I'm doing, um, this volume is, is incredibly valuable. Uh, Marilyn is using texts from Hollywood films. M Melanie, you just mentioned, um, you know, I was actually also surprised <laughs> just how much of, uh, like she's engaging with literary criticism, right? Um, and I had had these conversations with her uh, about films on, on the Korean War, which I was like, wow, she really knows <laughs> her filmography on the Korean War. But it was really incredible to get um, the, the kind of, close parsing the kind of granular work, right? Um, alongside her wit <laughs> in, in terms of, um, and, and weaving that in with, you know, speeches from policymakers, right? Letters from ordinary citizens to Truman. It's just so incredibly rich and full. And for me as a, a a teacher right now in the classroom on US empire and American foreign relations, it, it just speaks immediately to kind of a core thing I'm trying to get across to my students, which is that empire itself is multi and interdisciplinary actually, right? Um, and we have to engage with that in order to figure out multiple ways at any given moment to pay attention to how power is operating. Um, so just these, um, this collection is just so powerful um, in, in terms of conveying that. So I had two questions for um, Mary and Mark. Um, the first one is, is more about kind of the process of bringing this collection together. And um, for me, the value of reading these essays, and you had mentioned many of which are, were unpublished, I could actually see where certain texts served as key touchstones for Marilyn's thinking. So for example, I noticed um, John Dos Passos's um, 1919 actually appears in two different chapters. And it actually made me go to go and track down a copy of the novel <laughs> last month. I have not read it yet in its entirety. Um, but I was wondering if there were any other kinds of touchstones that you had encountered, you know, um, either particular texts or um, phrases that you could just see that Marilyn was using this as a way to kind of work through something, right? Um, and maybe later we can chat about uh, what you think the novel 19. 19 does for, for Marilyn. Um, but again, I was just wondering if there were um, things that you could 
see that Marilyn was trying to work through, right, um, in these writings. And my second question stems from something um, you had both written in the introduction, um, quote, for Young, a key element of the politics of war was culture, especially how war was remembered. And that made me think, um, Mary, there was this one time when you told me that Marilyn had really encouraged you to write your book, Wartime. And that book has been such an important book for me in my teaching um, because it, the way that it really explodes the concept of war as a discrete temporally bound event, right? And um, as I'm looking at my current undergraduate students, almost all of them were uh, born after 9-11, right? Um, so I was wondering if both of you could speak a bit on how you see Marilyn's writings potentially impacting this generation, or at least how you hope her writing might impact this generation. Because um, I think this generation, they, they will actually deeply understand what you have written else, you know, elsewhere in the introduction to the collection, which is that Marilyn was trying to show how, quote, war was both ever present and physically absent for most Americans. So those are my two questions, if you would like to uh, take them up. Um, but again, thank you so much for um, including me on this. Thanks so much, Monica. Um, very thoughtful remarks. Um, let me turn it over to, to Mary and Mark. Uh, um, to respond to Monica's. Uh, I'd like to give a chance perhaps to if she's got some questions, but uh, first Mary or, or Mark, either. You would need to unmute. Yeah, yeah. sorry. And, um, and excuse the little puppy, uh, my rescue dog, Frida, who was so quiet. I had no idea she was in my office. Um, so she wanted to join the conversation. No so she might have to end up in my lap. But let me actually address the second point um, because um, I think that it's the next generation that um, uh, for whom Marilyn's work is so crucially important. Um, and, uh, you know, we're moving into an era when the dynamics that she identified are even more present. At least it seems that way to us now, right? Um, there could be, you know, uh, non-miniaturized war that happens again, right? But, but, but we're moving into this, and she reflects on this in some of her essays, the, um, uh, the, the move towards drones, the move towards surveillance, and and essentially the the sort of miniaturization of, of war and and she did reflect in, in in light of her bombing civilians essay, um, you know it, in, in if you make a mistake with um, with drones, she um, said at one point, you know it it takes out a dinner party, but if you make a mistake, you know in Vietnam it would take out a village, and and so it was useful to move to more precise warfare in some respects, but then it has this pernicious quality of making it less sort of uh, less, less seen. And, um, and her focus on culture is so important for how we think about things moving forward because, um, uh, you know, the, and this on, on some level invokes Sam Moyne's um, work on the idea of humanity um, and the, but, but more broadly, the way that humanitarian law um, gives us a language um, for thinking about um, certain kinds of killings as falling within humane boundaries. Um, and then, you know, the concept of collateral damage and how that develops over time. Um, so that uh, it, it, it seems as if, um, and, and it seems this way, like to an American public is consuming the narrative, uh, that, that war is, is precise, they're trying really hard, um, those hardworking drone operators, for example, and, and even the, the, um, the interesting literature on the stress and harm, psychological harm to the operators of US technologies. But so it all sort of comes together uh, into a, a culture of 
um, you know, well, I add its most importance, um, a culture that lacks any understanding of what the destruction of war actually is experienced like. Um, and so even to the extent Americans see it in videos from say a, you know, a, 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 a mistargeted drone strike, it's still this, you know, seeing it through video links, um, consuming it as a TV narrative. Um, so I think that both the combination of the tech changes in technologies of war um, and the narratives surrounding US use of force and, and um, the effectiveness or the re reasons behind those technologies makes war ever more invisible um, and therefore all the more palatable um, to an American public that tends to, you know, it enables the, the, the forgetting that's really at this, uh, a, a central uh, uh, argument in her work. Um, so I, you know, I hope that it'll achieve her purpose, the book will, of thinking about how it is we come to not understand um, what the uses of American power are. How is it that war is forgotten um, now and why does that matter? So, um, so I hope that, that those will be, um, those ideas will be useful um, to the next generation of students and scholars. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you know what, what I'm struck by Monica when I think about 1919 is that, you know, that whole Das Passos trilogy is in terms of its method, incredibly experimental, right? There's little newsreels, there's little cartoons, there's little this, there's little that. I mean, he's got just all these threads that he's weaving into this. And I don't think it's any surprise that Marilyn liked Dos Passos because I think Marilyn thought a lot, I mean, there'd be Dos Passos' politics, which I'm not so sure she would have been so interested in, but just in terms of you know how he wrote, she was interested in method. She was interested in coming into these issues in ways that quite frankly, most diplomatic historians had not. And you know, Melanie, when you were saying that there's this nice dual thing that's going on in her work, right? That Marilyn could help you understand why you needed to know your military history well, because the only way that you would be able to sort of understand fundamentally what was going on was to put yourself in that world and then to be able to come back out of that world and to critique it, but you could only do it from the knowledge within. And at the same time, she saw culture as fundamental to the ways in which you would think that. And there are very few people who can move back and forth between those zones in the way that she was able to. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a whole set of younger scholars um, and people coming up in graduate school who don't necessarily see the world in the ways in which traditional historians have. Um, and that they're excited about thinking in different ways about method and the ways in which they might be able to draw um, a whole variety of ex experiential texts, whether those are cultural texts or whether those are just texts recovered on the ground in thinking about the work that they do. And here's a person who was making those claims, not loudly, but just in the kind of ways that she went about her work throughout an ent her entire career. Again, at a time when, you know, quite frankly, diplomatic historians just didn't do that, right? But she did. And, you know, in a way, like she's the last man standing because I think people are more likely to pick that combination of work up now than what was seen as, you know, the more sort of strictly by the, by the book's history in that point. You know, there's a rich literature in diplomatic history and I don't mean this as some like massive critique, but to appreciate her own originality in the moment. And then to see the ways in which a younger group of scholars might just see that as exciting and want to run with that in their own work or see it as inspirational in one form or another. That's kind of where Despasos would be in my head in thinking about um, why it pops up now and again in what she writes. Thank you. Melanie, did you have any follow-up questions? Yeah. 
Yes, um, I, I just used my raise hand function there. Um, so I just wanted to ask the, the two editors a little bit more about um, what got left out of the book. Like you made some choices clearly here and um, including a choice, I think, not to excerpt anything from the Vietnam Wars. Is that right? So um, I just wondered what was driving um, uh, you know, you wanted to make it accessible to students, surely, but what was driving the selection and what kinds of things you had to leave out that, you know, you might still feel like a, you know, a, a missing limb or something. Um, what, what, what is not here that you would have maybe wanted to if you had worlds enough in time? Yeah, I can start with that, Mary, because I had an idea about two things that I wanted in the volume that eventually we let go of and it made sense to me that we did in the end, but that wasn't kind of the way I was thinking about it coming into it. And partly, I mean, I immediately thought of something from the Vietnam Wars, right? It would just necessarily need to be there. And then I also thought it might've been interesting to do something from rhetoric of empire. So you could just sort of see the arc of kind of first book and that conceptualization forward. And Mary and I really talked both of those ideas out over a long period of time. And, and Mary, you may remember it somewhat differently than I do, but I, what I remember is we both eventually felt that in certain ways, the Vietnam Wars was not exertable in a way that would work to do the kind of larger work that we wanted to do in the volume. That to really get it, we'd say, well, then we need, we couldn't just have that chapter, we need the one before, and then we need the one after. And, th and those would all show, you know, that again, books are tricky in that regard, right? They don't necessarily lend themselves as articles do to that kind of work. Sometimes they need time. And I think, as I recall, that was kind of it with the Vietnam Wars, that we couldn't, it either was gonna swamp the book or, you know, we, we just couldn't, couldn't manage it. And I think there was a kind of quality with rhetoric of empire about that as well. You know, that it's an, it's an argument that starts to move as the best books do, um, as you move through it. And, and harder to really just pull it out in some ways. So some of it may be genre, I think, in a way. Thank you. Um, any other questions by um, um, panelists? Yeah, I wanted to sure. sort of, um, follow up um, on the on on how we decided what what to include and, and what to leave out. You know, one of the things that happened was, and this was especially the rhetoric of empire volume, um, it became clear that Marilyn was deeply engaging just a much older historiography, right? And so uh, it, it, um, it, a historiography that the field had moved beyond in many ways. And, and so, uh, and so it, it, it didn't seem that, um, it, that would, a, a selection would work for a Feshrit volume, but not for a sort of leaner, more focused volume. And, and that also affected some of the article selections. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we had to leave out things we, we, we loved an essay in one of Mark's collections, an essay in a collection of mine on 9-11. On and, um, and so we really tried to think about of everything, you know, what would put put what would present itself as the most powerful sort of arc um, over overall. Um, but um, yeah, it was very very hard to leave things out. Thank you. Let me remind our audience that uh, you can join this conversation by using the raised hand function and the Zoom functionality, and you can also pose your questions in the, in the Q&A um, function. Um, we have had several um, longish questions by um, XR Patinio. I wonder if uh, e, uh, we could call on you just to perhaps pose your question succinctly to the audience uh, in person. Would that be uh, um, all right if you could uh, if we could call on you, um, you could raise your raise your hand. There we go. And now we can call on you and give you the mic. Uh, 
There we go. Yeah, if you could please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Well, thank you so much. I'm just confused by whether or not the war that we're fighting now is a continuation of the war that we began, especially considering the issue in China with the opium wars and the now ending of the hundred years of shame and the sense that that has to the fentanyl and opium that was coming into the U.S. this past year where 100K thousand people died. Is the war about drugs, oil, human trafficking, or is it really about power? And if so, where is that power? Is that power in people? And is that the human infrastructure we need to invest in? And if so, is history and understanding what makes us who we are a part of that redefining this new normal? Will we in the future know like the archives will show what happened in the last presidential election before we withdrew from Afghanistan, or will that all be a mystery for the next 70 plus years or more? Thank you. Thank you. Would like to take that on. Mary, Mark, anyone else? You know, Melanie mentioned um, in her remarks that she was struck by a kind of mid nineties piece by Marilyn and a sense of kind of hopefulness that maybe it was gonna be different. And then reading pieces that were post 9-11 and realizing particularly that last piece, the presidential address, you know, that she had kind of come to a position that suggested that maybe that optimism was misplaced. I, I think in her work, she oscillated between those points of view over time. I mean, the big argument here would be, is there essential continuity in American foreign policy over the long durée, or is it change? That is what people want to be identifying in, in one form or another. And I think as a person who essentially came with a new left perspective to the way in which she thought about history, that there is a lot of structure in that. And there is a sense that there is a long backstory um, that would go back obviously farther than um, the Philippines and the Boxer Rebellion, but would go back to the way in which the West was settled in the United States or what became the United States. But I do think that that sense of the world was always a bit intention for her, that there was a sense that there was a contingent world um, and that the possibilities of change were there. And, and I think in some ways, that was another side of what the new left was all about. It was essentially the hope that transformational change could come in one form or another. So I don't know, you know, in reading her own work, whether there's an answer one way or another to the question um, that you're posing, but it is an essential question for all we do to be thinking about, again, continuities over time and where we wanna talk about ruptures or transformations and also the uneasiness that we all have in trying to figure out are we in a rupture right now? Are we not? What does that mean when we thought we were in one 50 years ago, when we thought we were in one 100 years ago? You know, it breeds a certain modesty in some ways in the kinds of pronouncements that we make about the past. But that's all about uncertainty. That's not about a sense of assurance about continuity over time. Thank you. Eric? So I have a historiographical question. Um, when I read Marilyn Young's work, um, I'm often very much engaged by, you know, both the passion and there's a wit and there's a bite uh, to what she writes. Um, she did a review maybe nine years ago in diplomatic history um, of the Cambridge history, you know, and there are just so many, I guess, zingers uh, is the right word. Um, um, you know, she knows where to hit um, and, and how to hit. But I'm wondering if you could step back and place her work you know, in the broader Cold War historiography. She comes out of a new left tradition. Um, this is a field that has conservatives and moderates in it. Um, she punches, but have people punched back? Uh, and so how, how, where does she fit um, um, over time and today um, into kind of the broad frame of, of Cold War historiography? Thanks, Eric. Mary, Mark, or Melanie and Monica? Uh, 
Um, I, Mark actually wrote beautifully about, about part of this um, in, in the introduction. We wrote it together. Um, but she, she was part of a dissenting tradition um, initially in, uh, in Cold War historiography. Um, and, uh, and, then, and, and, and throughout it, she's basically writing against uh, the master narratives. Um, so, uh, so she's been a key figure. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting though, because Marilyn was a woman writing at a time when the field was male. Uh, a time when women were really excluded. Uh, so, so what's what's um, one of the things that's significant is uh, is the way that she found and uh, and really solidified her voice um, and and her focus. She, you know, when you go through her archives, I actually went through her papers. It's a very small collection. It's at NYU in the Tenement Library, and um, it's available and open. And I think there are great papers to write based on on that, but one of the things you see in that collection is the way that Vietnam ended up shaping her career. Um, and maybe this partly sort of circles over Melanie to the, the importance of the, of the Vietnam book in her, and, and Vietnam in her sort of conceptualization of the field and also her life as, as a scholar. Um, you know, she got involved with the anti-war left. Um, you know, she ends up going on a peace mission uh, she was deeply involved with left intellectuals um, in, in, in around New York. Um, and she got very focused on the, um, the teaching, uh, you know, uh, Vietnam era teachings. So, so during that era, she really combined um, being an intellectual and a scholar and, and being an activist. Um, and um, so I think that um, this was, uh, and anyway, so that, that to me is a signal aspect of her life. She wasn't just sitting back in the archives um, and, and writing about war. Um, she was using what she knew um, and using the powers of her voice um, to organize um, and to be um, an engaged um, anti-war activist. Um, so, so that's uh, one of the things that you don't always see, right? Because we just read the literature uh, that people write, we don't see their life story, but that, that's something that we can hear more of um, from, you know, hopefully there will be students in New York who go use her archives and, and write more about uh, what she did during the Vietnam War era. Thanks, that's one thing that, you know, she struggled with, I think, um, later in her career was where she had come down on Vietnamese politics. So, you know, the descriptions of North Vietnamese policy and conditions in North Vietnam over the war that are in the Vietnam Wars, I don't think are ones that really are fully sustainable for teaching students anymore. And I think Marilyn was one of the first to acknowledge that, that there was a narrative about the North that had to do with anti-war activism and a lack of access to Vietnamese archives, Vietnamese perspectives that she did come to regret. And yet what was interesting about that regret was it didn't lead in the normal sort of paths of like new left regret about what people had thought about communists, right? It didn't lead, you know, the sort of Stalinists that became neocons and that kind of thing, right? Um, you know, she never lost the sense that the South was a complicated place and that actually the ways in which she talked about the South um, in that book, I think still are sustained by the way in which the literature has gone. It didn't really make her, fundamentally have to think differently about what it was Americans were doing there, or at least American policymakers were doing there, because that had little to do with on the ground realities as well. But the fact that that did trouble her, and that I think some of the work on memory that she was engaged in, again, later in her life, was an effort to try to explore that territory in more complex ways. Mary knows a little bit more about this than I do, but you know, Viet Thanh Nguyen, um, who's written these two just magisterial novels about the war, wrote a book on memory, um, you know, before he did the fiction. And both he and Marilyn engaged quite a bit back and forth on that. And I think that was actually, those conversations were kind of one place where she was sort of trying to think through 
some of those issues, the ways in which she had seen things coming into it, the way in which that might have changed. But again, what I would say there is it's just, it, it's a kind of extraordinary person who is willing to step back and say, maybe I didn't get that right, right? And, and, and want to try to figure it out in, in one form or another. Um, and I admired that about her in all of this. Thank you. Could I ask, um, just- I just, I, I just wanted to throw in an answer to that question really quickly. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is quite what Eric was getting at, but I remember, you know, the, the Marilyn was uh, very uh, forthright in her uh, opinions and spoke them clearly as somebody mentioned. And uh, I was on a panel she was on about 9-11, uh, 10 years after 9-11. And uh, people were talking then, and I know a lot of us at that point were teaching US and the world. And by that point, beginning to teach students who would come back who had served in the wars and then in the uh iraq war and the afghan wars and they would be coming into classrooms so there's a big panel of, uh, at schaefer and a lot of people at schaefer of course are teaching these u.s in the world courses and they're teaching more and more and more to vets and so they were asking uh i believe andy basic which was on the panel too but they were asking marilyn and andy basic about what it meant to teach to vets so we're asking all of us but they answered but I mean, to teach to vets in a way that was sympathetic to what they had been through, that was respectful, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember Marilyn saying, um, uh, you know, somebody had said something about sometimes students begin to question whether they had gone to war for nothing. And uh, Marilyn said, oh, no, I never tell my students who served that they went to war for nothing. I tell them that they went to war for much worse than nothing. And so you can imagine, you know, that that say like that confrontational relationship to saying this, these wars are not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this in any way. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna up the stakes. Um, she definitely, some of the folks who felt differently about how they wanted to teach or engage with vets um, had some concerns. I think it's fair to say. Thank you. Um, Andrea. Bertrand um, posed a question in the uh, chat function. How does punishment in the duration intersect with the forever warfare? Did Marilyn Young ever talk about that? Any clues? Amazing panel. Mary or Mark? Um, any comments? Christian, not, you, cut, you cut out like right in the middle of that. And so I missed I'm sorry. It. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me, um, sorry about that. Um, so Andrea Beltram um, asked the question, how does punishment in the US that is mass incarceration intersect with forever warfare? Did Marilyn Young ever talk about that? Any clues? Mary, did you see evidence of that when you were going through papers? I mean, it, you know, in conversation, yes, I remember her talking about that and talking about the links back and forth, but in terms of writing. Yeah, I, I hesitated um, because I, um, I don't see that in her writing. I'm trying to think back to some of her essays. Um, you know, really she's writing about, you know, for example, The Big Sleep, you know, writing about the war theater and how that is understood. And, and I think she sees that as her subject. And, um, and, and so the, um, the, the sort of broad perspective that, um, that, that, uh, that sees mass incarceration as parallel to some of the US practices overseas I, I don't see that in, in, her, in her scholarship. And, you know, perhaps that's um, just a generational matter. Um, I, I don't think that makes her work less powerful for um, students and scholars of a generation where people are sort of thinking across categories in that way, um, because that syncs with essentially the methodology that Marilyn invoked that was important in the realm that she did write about. You know, that we, in order to understand things, we have to think about 
ca across categories, that's the experience of war and how the experience of war is forgotten and the forgetting is in part through cultural features. Um, so yeah, so, so no, I don't think you'll find it and that might be disappointing, but I think that there's a lot um, that, that there's nevertheless um, there to learn. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, Stephen Shore asked the question that the US has frequently acted like the great power it is should not come as a surprise to anyone. Does this book have any real world advice for when, where, and how the US should use its military power? Mary, unmute yourself, please. Well, um, she, um, on the how, right? Use it less. <laughs> um, uh, understand. I mean, tr tr it's tremendously important to point out that Americans don't understand what their um, government is doing. They, they don't understand, not because they don't have the capacity to think it through, but because they lack the visceral experience of being in a context where shooting, um, bombing, um, and the uh, fallout of war is happening. So this experience is foreign to the US polity um, because war doesn't happen here. We've been obviously privileged that it doesn't happen here. Now, sort of thinking back to the last question, you know, if we, um, if we think of US war as incorporating war against minority communities, for example, Ferguson, um, and the other um, um, uh, arenas where we've had uh, tremendous police violence um, against communities of color, you know, then we, but, but, but again, Maryland didn't sort of go deeply into analogizing those two, but um, so, so uh, the, in terms of the, the how um, it, uh, I think her, I think her assumption, and this goes back to, you know, the um, important, the importance of the teachings in the Vietnam era, um, that I think she believed and hoped that understanding war and understanding what the US government was doing with its war power would um, help restrain war. So I, she, she certainly was passionately interested in restraint um, and um, her, a, a key lesson of her work is that, um, is that this sort of culture of forgetting um, doesn't allow for there to be any kind of robust anti-war politics because Americans are essentially um, usually asleep about it. The, um the sort of top 10 list that I began my presentation with, you know, in, in a way, if you were imagining Marilyn at a teach-in, you would reverse engineer each of those 10 things. And by doing so, cumulatively, begin to kind of peel back a whole set of untruths about what it is American wars have done. So at that level, you know, I think she was, um, remarkably on the ground about it, you know? Um, you can take those as flip, but in fact, they're not flip at all. There are 10 really fundamental ways by which the American state has managed military affairs over a long period of time and to dive into each of those in some detail, as she did in some of her work and, you know, not in others, um, would, would provide people with, um, I don't know, a. I mean, Marilyn wasn't really somebody who did policy recommendations exactly, but in terms of just the ethos by which people were thinking of wars, those would seem like central elements that one would want to think of in one form or another. Thank you. Do you, just curious, do you know if uh, Marilyn ever engaged with veterans of the wars that she's written about in terms of the experience? Yeah, no, she did, Christian. You know, there was a lot of, um, I, I think this is where some of her, 
interest in culture and literature came together in a way that in fact um, made talking across um, easier in a way. Um, she was actively involved. There was a project at UMass's William Joyner Center that was trying to link uh, Vietnam veterans, both North and South, with American veterans of the war, people who were poets, people who were writers. They were doing some early trips back and forth to um, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City before diplomatic recognition came. Um, and she was involved in some of those and engaged with some of um, the writers in, in that sort of way. So I think that was a pretty substantial um, set of conversations for her particularly as she was turning to thinking about memory and, and forms of memory. There may have been other, other ways that she was engaged with veterans as well, but that, that's the one that I remember most distinctly. I would just add that one of her most important interlocutors was Andrew Basevich, uh, who is a veteran uh, as well as a military historian. Um, so I think that dealing with people who have fought in US wars um, was Im important to her, you know, both having the conversations, disagreeing about certain things, um, but also I'm sure she learned from, that was part of, you know, how, how she came to understand how wars were experienced. Thank you. John Fusek um, writes, I applaud your decision not to incorporate excerpts from her published books, Mary and Mark. These books are out in the world and will last. The essays get lost. When I heard you were working on this collection, it lifted my spirits. Marilyn had more to say and teach than ever appeared in book form. And she was a brilliant essayist. In putting this volume together, how have you considered her simply as an essayist, as a writer? Well, um, I, I, I love that comment um, because of course that's, one of the things that we wanted to capture was that beautiful writing, um, and um, and and it even came up in you know the 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 conference um, you know top ten list, which she just sort of gave uh, uh, at a at a um, at the AHA, um, and I'm forgetting his name. Um, someone who was there um, went up to her and said, "Boy, I'd love to have a copy of that," and he and she said, "Here." And, and gave him her copy. He had that, gave it to me, and, and that's how it came, came in the book. He's thanked in, in, in the volume. Um, but, um, but she was so funny, as well as being so, um, uh, as well as writing so brilliantly. And um, I would, if you want to just find one thing, uh, it would be her Schaefer presidential um, lecture, which you know she gave to the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, certainly used to be and still has elements of kind of a button down, kind of old, had been old fashioned institution. And here she's the third president uh, in, you know, it was going towards 50 years, a third female president. Um, and, and so to this, um, you know, traditionally, you know, kind of old fashioned group, um, this sort of anti-war uh, 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 woman um, delivers this brilliant um, and incredibly well-written and piercing um, essay about how we can't forget war. Um, so I just totally agree um, that uh, that this work needed to reach an audience, you know, besides, you know, diplomatic historians who are, you know, now just this wonderful and diverse group, but um, we want to share it with the world. Um, and if you teach U.S. history, please take a look at the book um, and, and at least recommend it to your students. There's Thank a you. performative quality about the way in which everybody delivers, you know, the talks that they give. And there was particularly so with Marilyn. And sometimes, you know, having seen a lot of those and including the presidential address that Mary is talking about, it's a kind of, oh, you had to be there to really get it. But actually she could write in such a way, and this goes back to the question about, you know, essays and why collect essays, where that, performative quality that kind of put the argument over 
also works in prose. And I think Monica beautifully nailed that with, uh, you know, the quote about the Korean War is a pinto of a war, right? I mean, you know, that works on the printed page that worked in the room, right? But again, often moving back and forth in that way and having it really work analytically in writing, it's hard to, it's hard to make it happen. But I think she was somebody who could do that in the kind of essays that she wrote. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to bring this to an end. I do want to, at the very end, read into the record here uh, um, uh, a post by Benjamin Green. I'd like to return to Mark's earlier comment about Marilyn's intellectual curiosity and her willingness to listen and learn from those she may suspect will disagree with her. She was a tremendous inspiration, mentor, and friend to a number of Schaefer historians who are, all, who are also veterans of recent wars including Greg Dadis, Aaron O'Connell, and myself. Although we were each closer to Marilyn's views than stereotypes about service members would suggest, Marilyn, Marilyn always gave us the benefit of the doubt. With that, I'd like to thank Mark and Mary and Melanie and Monica for a really terrific and poignant conversation. Over to Eric for concluding remarks. And thank you all and thank you, Christian. So please join us one week from today on Monday, October 18th at 4 p.m. when we return to discuss a just published book by Thomas Guglielmo entitled Divisions, A New History of Racism and Resistance in America's World War II Military with Adrian Lentz Smith and Takashi Fujitani joining us as discussants. Until then, take care and good night. <laughs>